चलिए ये कर Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Julia Malamed, and I'm with uh, Jonaki Deepak today, a pulmonologist, and we work in the University of Maryland Medical Center Tobacco Health Practice at Midtown. Thank you for coming today. Um, so we are trained in tobacco treatment. And we've taken classes on tobacco treatment. We follow all the latest literature. Uh, to make sure that we're providing our patients the best care. So um, with all that we know now about the risks of tobacco use, it can seem a little confusing why people would start using tobacco in the first place. But a big reason has to do with the marketing tactics that tobacco companies use to get people hooked. So we often make the mistake of blaming people for using tobacco, but really that's what tobacco companies want us to think. It's a trap. Uh, the tobacco companies have been lying and cheating um, to make sure that people are addicted and to make sure that the public thinks those people are to blame instead of the companies themselves. Uh, they also target certain communities, such as children, parents, the military, the black community, the LGBTQ community, all with specific strategies um, that they believe might appeal to those groups. Um, so they've tried to tell you that smoking is good for you, that even doctors smoke and they smoke camels, um, that smoking will keep you thin, that it'll calm your nerves. They also tell you that you'll look really cool if you smoke and that everybody's doing it. It'll elevate your social status. And one other reason um, people start using tobacco is most of our patients have parents who use tobacco when they were children. And if your parents use tobacco, uh, you are more likely to start using tobacco. Dr. Deepak. Thank you, Julia. So, yes, we are in it because we are trained in it, but tobacco honestly is both our passion. Uh, it's definitely been a passion of mine for a long time, and I was very lucky to find Julia, who is equally passionate about it, and we are trying to help as many people as possible. If you noticed in all those advertisements, what you would see is happy people, smiley people, people in phenomenal clothes, they look good. They do not choose anyone who looks run it ragged or anyone who's wearing a plaid shirt or anyone who has wrinkles on their skin. Unfortunately, all the stop tobacco stop smoking ads have people with all negative connotations. So with a hole in your neck, they have people wearing ugly clothes, they have ugly looking people. So it basically makes it much more conducive to look at nice ads about products rather than looking at bad ads about why you should stop using it. The other crazy thing in terms of getting people hooked in it is if you noticed one of the ads was definitely targeting young kids. So a lot of the ads now are targeting pictures like which look like sour patches, but that actually contains nicotine. So all the vape device ads definitely are targeting the young children. And we as parents or as people who know other children need to be very, very careful. So once you get hooked, why do people keep smoking right when we say tobacco we mean any kind of combustible tobacco that's a big word which basically says anything you light up like cigarettes cigars cigarellos hooker vape devices are not considered combustible because they're electronic but they behave just like a combustible tobacco product and then there is something like a heated tobacco product called ECOS. That is also something new, which you're going to see with all the younger generations. So you need to be looking in their backpacks and making sure that they're not carrying something fancy in there, which looks like a USB, because all you know 
it may be actually a tobacco product. So the tobacco companies have become very smart from telling that camels are good for doctors to now looking at ways to look at it without using the word smoking or cigarettes anywhere. So you get hooked on to smoking. So why do people still continue to smoke? Uh, can you have the next slide, please? So usually people say because it looks cool, and I would say that is much more for the younger generation who are using the electronic devices, the vape devices, the e-cigarettes, rather than the older generation who is smoking, because smoking cigarettes is not considered cool anymore. As you know, Everywhere you go, you're not allowed to smoke indoors. You have to go outside to smoke. So it's not considered cool. But if you see in this picture, that is an electronic cigarette, and that is considered cool. For some reason, smoking electronic cigarettes is considered cool. It's what you need to do to fit in in school and fit in with your friends. Like how earlier it used to be that you need to start smoking to fit in with your friends now it is more about the electronic cigarettes but it's all about humans are meant to live in society it's all about being accepted being part of a group nobody wants to be alone it is a very difficult thing to be alone and then you have things like mm, this person is not strong enough i stopped smoking i decided i'm going to stop i stopped smoking this person doesn't have the willpower to stop smoking not true not true at all. They don't care about the health risk. They don't care whether they get cancer. They don't care whether they get, you know, wrinkled skin. I think everybody cares about their health. It's not that they don't care. It's because of the effect of nicotine on the brain. And I'm going to tell you more about it. And then we've heard that people get anxious when they cannot vape. That's a big problem. And again, for the young kids, and if you see the ads, they're also targeting false messages like anxiety will be decreased if you use a vape device. Anxiety will be decreased if you use the disposable e-cigarette like puff. Anxiety will be decreased if you smoke. Not true. Actually, it increases anxiety, but it will make you feel that you're not anxious. So how does it do it? Next slide, please. So nicotine is a very unique substance. It is the only substance in the world that acts on the part of the brain which is responsible for telling us what is safe and what is unsafe. If you all, all remember, when your kids, your mom told you, don't put your hand on fire, you'll get burned. Don't go, don't cross the road without looking on both sides because you don't want to be hit by a car. So we know that these things are unsafe. That part of the brain that processes the safety and harmful signals, that part of the brain for every single human is actually controlled by nicotine receptors. These nicotine receptors tell us what is safe, what is unsafe. When you smoke a cigarette or you use an e-cigarette or you are using a cigar or a cigarello or a hookah and there is nicotine in there, that nicotine goes to your brain and it goes in seconds. It's like six seconds. It goes to the brain because they engineer the nicotine such that it goes immediately to the brain. And then it tells the brain it goes and sits on that part of the brain and it tells the brain, as long as you see me, everything is good with the world. So I can be having a horrible, stressful day. I just had a fight with someone at work. I go out, I smoke the cigarette. <sighs> everything is good with the world. COVID is going on. Everything is stressful. I have that puff of cigarette and I cannot describe the sensation I feel. That sensation you get when you smoke is because of the fact that it controls the safety part of your brain. So when it controls the safety part of the brain, 
if you try to take that away, it creates an internal turmoil, an internal anxiety of feeling that something is not right and you have that compulsion to pick up the cigarette and smoke or pick up the vape device and inhale. So that part of it is only, only, only created by nicotine. So the nicotine part of the brain, which controls the brain, makes you feel phenomenally good, excellent. But as it's making your brain feel phenomenally good, it is eating away the rest of your body. So it's like a parasite which has come inside you. It makes your brain feel phenomenal, but it eats away the rest of your body. It's almost like if you've ever seen that men in black, these outer organisms come and take over your brain. And meanwhile, they're destroying you, but they make you feel really, really good. So that is part of the reason why if you ever walk around our hospitals, you will find that some doctors smoke, some nurses smoke, some respiratory therapists smoke, other healthcare workers smoke. It's because they cannot help themselves. Next slide, please. So it is very, very, very hard to give up. Every single person who smokes knows that you have this daily fight between the devil and angel. Remember, the sexy devil is our nicotine inside all these devices, whether it's cigarettes, cigars, vape devices, and it says, hey, I'm the cool person. I'm cool. You got to have me so that you feel good. And the part of the brain which is rational, which tells you, please don't smoke. It's causing you to have health effects. That part of the brain's like, shush, don't talk. I got you. I'm making you feel good. So that part of the brain, which is controlled by nicotine, is unfortunately always the more controlled or the more dominant part of the brain. So it is a real fight for people to stop smoking because of that. Next slide, please. So we have a couple of uh, statements here. So a lot of people tell you, and including the FDA says this in some cases, that vapes and e-cigarettes are safer than smoking regular cigarettes. It is not true. Safer does not mean safe. If you ever look at the Truth Initiative, it tells you that statement very clearly. Safer does not mean safe. There are many other available tobacco treatments other than vape devices or e-cigarettes because in, an, in addition to containing heavy metals, which will never put inside your body otherwise, it contains aldehydes like formaldehyde, acetaldehyde, all this which destroys your lungs and it contains all these flavoring agents like mango, strawberry, unicorn milk. These things are being inhaled into your lungs and they destroy the lungs. As a lung doctor, one of the first things I tell my patients is, do you have scented candles at home? Do you have oil diffusers at home? Do you have Glade plugins at home? If you have any of this, get rid of it because oil flavoring agents are bad for your lungs. And vape devices and e-cigarettes and even the new cigars and cigarellos, all of them have flavoring agents. All, most of them, vape devices definitely have heavy metals. They also contain silica. Let's not forget that. A lot of us know silica is bad for the lungs. It contains silica too. Next one, please. So, I think I talked about this. The best way to stop smoking is cold turkey. For some people, cold turkey works, but not for everyone. My dad used to be a chain smoker and he stopped cold turkey. But he told me later on that it was the worst decision he made. He said, I wish I had a doctor like you who took me through treatment because I went through hell and I nearly relapsed so many times. And that's what happens with our patients because it's a disease. We never say 
Can you quit diabetes? Can you quit asthma? Can you quit high blood pressure? We say, let us treat your high blood pressure. Let us treat your diabetes. Let us treat your asthma. So smoking is a disease. It is not a habit. So it's not something that you just quit cold turkey. Next. Lot of people with cancer, they'll tell you this routinely that you need to stop smoking. Otherwise you can't start treatment. That is not true. We can do both the things at the same time. Next, please. Think that there's a glitch. It's not advancing, Julia. Ah, there we go. Now, you should wear a patch while smoking. It's a fact. You should wear a patch while smoking. If you take one thing, one message from me, please wear the patch and smoke. Anyone who tells you, you need to remove the patch and then if you smoke is wrong. The way the patch works is that you have to be wearing it when you smoke because it slowly decreases the one, it slowly makes the cigarettes not taste good. You don't feel like smoking. You feel a little lightheaded. That is the way it is supposed to work. There is nothing like nicotine overdose that occurs from the patch. Remember the patch, the gum, the lozenge, there's a nicotine inhaler that contains nicotine, but that nicotine is not addictive. And that nicotine does not cause the bad side effects of the cigarette nicotine, the vape nicotine, the cigar nicotine. It is a different mechanism. And also it does not cause addiction. Next slide, please. And it's never too late. We've had 80 year olds who have stopped smoking and they feel phenomenal. They feel excellent. So it's never too late, never. Next slide, please. It is much easier to give up alcohol and heroin than nicotine. Everybody has addiction. My addiction is currently one of the Indian movies on Netflix. Every day I see it, it's ridiculous. I've seen it so many times till now, but I see it every day. Everybody has an addiction. But you know, nicotine addiction is the most powerful addiction in the world. The most powerful, which is why we cannot be giving vape devices and e-cigarettes to young kids. Next slide. Is vaping dangerous? Absolutely. Uh, Julia will tell you, I think I talk about vaping a lot. It is absolutely bad. I tell my patients, if smoke, smoking cigarettes is rat poison, vaping is like snake venom. It's like viper venom. It's not just any snake venom. It's like a viper venom. It's horrible. It is not at all safe. It contains really high levels of nicotine. The jewel contains about two packs of cigarettes in that one pod. The Sorin pod contains about nearly, nearly four, four and a half packs of cigarettes. It is untenable. By the way, one cigar is like a pack of cigarettes. So any of you who are smoking the cigar, I'm looking good. The older shows used to show this Colombo, this great detective smoking cigars. It was considered cool. That is not cool either because that is a lot of nicotine in there too. And it has many other agents which are bad for the lungs. As I said, strawberries, mangoes, bananas, all these are excellent fruits to eat. They are not good fruits to inhale into your lungs. And it can cause a lot of lung injury, which can even persist. We are seeing this a lot. And with vaping, there is marijuana vaping too. So remember, Cigarette companies are not altruistic. All the vape companies are now bought up by big tobacco. So basically, even though they tell you that it has zero nicotine, they're still putting nicotine with marijuana because they know that they make it much more addictive that way. And then you get hooked onto it and then your lungs are destroyed. So 
they absolutely want your money they don't care about your health otherwise they'll be building hospitals i mean you never know next thing you know they may be building hospitals so that they can spend their free money that they're getting from other places and get tax breaks next slide please so you know how can people stop stop using any tobacco product it's as i said it's a disease we don't have people to give up diabetes we don't have people say just give up your asthma we treat it we are the ummc tobacco health practice we do not judge you we have we do not ask you to set up a quit date because setting up a quit date is like telling yourself that you want to feel unsafe nobody ever wants to feel under threat nobody wants to feel unsafe so we never say oh let's set a quit date let's set this let's set that we in fact say don't set the goal of stopping smoking rather let's go on this journey together take the medicines and let us see what we achieve if you cut down a little that's as good as continuing to smoke the same amount we have ability through the state to give you some free medicines not all medicines some of the medicines like what we call the nicotine replacement therapy that julia is going to tell you more about and i'm a lung doctor so i see you not just for tobacco health i definitely ask you more than that sometimes i may find out that you have some heart symptoms and i may send you to other doctors to see you too so i'm a doctor so i'm going to see you from head to foot not just part of it just for tobacco so we concentrate much more on the journey the effect of tobacco on your health and i have several awesome colleagues who do this with me so dr ellen marciniak she's a lung doctor too and she practices with me jamie hallenan who's a nurse practitioner who also does lung cancer screening we talked about our awesome tobacco coach julia melamad who's there with you today and the person who's working very hard in the background is sherry webster who's our medical secretary who helps schedule people into our clinic next slide please and now julia is going to tell you what actually happens during the visit so coming to see us in the tobacco health practice is just like attending any other appointment um, it's a one-on-one -on -one visit where you see us and we just talk about your history where you've been where you want to go and how we can help you get there so we want to hear your whole story what's your journey and we talk to you about why nicotine is so hard to stop but we're not here to lecture you about the effect of smoking or tobacco use on your health. Most people already know that smoking is bad for them because they feel that they're not breathing as well. Maybe they notice that um, their throat gets irritated when they smoke or they have a cough from smoking. So we, we already know that you know these things. We wanna to talk to you about how we can help you get rid of those things. And we work on a plan with you. Uh, we talk about two to three medicines that can help trick your brain to give you that safe feeling that you get from smoking as you're stopping smoking. You also get coaching from me. Um, so after your appointment, sometimes patients are a little confused, like, did they really tell me I can smoke with the nicotine patch on? I don't think that was right. I, I better not. Better be safe than sorry, right? Um, so I talk you through all that, make sure that um, you have everything you need to stay on track. And also our support is here for as long as you need us. If this is successful for you in a few months, great. If this takes you a year or two, we're still here with you to help you through it. Um, like Dr. Deepak was saying, we do have some free sample medicines through the state. Um, so we can help get you started with the medicines and also help you if your insurance isn't covering the medicines. Okay, so these are some of the medicines. Um, there are two types of medicines and both are really important for fighting this battle. The first type is called the controller medicines. And these are varenicline or Chantix, uh, bupropion or Welbutrin, both of those medicines are pills, and the nicotine patch. 
And then the rescue medicines are the nicotine inhaler, which is our most popular option. It's prescription only, so a lot of people haven't heard of that before, um, but it has been far and away our most popular option for the rescue medicines. Uh, some people like the nicotine lozenge or gum instead. And then the nicotine nasal spray is also an option, but usually not very well tolerated. So both types of medicines are important. They need to work together in order to help. If you only take Chantix or you only use the nicotine inhaler, um, you might cut down a little bit, but it's going to be so much harder to stop smoking entirely. And if you want the best shot at stopping smoking, and we absolutely want you to have the best chance, we strongly recommend using one medicine from each category or even two controllers. For example, you can use Chantix and the nicotine patch or Wellbutrin and the nicotine patch to give you an extra boost. An extra boost. Um, so these medicines do have some side effects, but what's important to know is that most are easily fixed by just changing a little bit how you use the medicine. Uh, the most common side effect we see with uh, Chantix is nausea, and that's easily prevented if you take Chantix with a meal. So if you take it with your breakfast and you take it with your dinner, uh, you're most, most, much less likely to have an upset stomach from it. Some people also complain of weird dreams from Chantix. Sometimes they're bad dreams, sometimes they're just funny. Um, well, Butrin is pretty well tolerated. Sometimes people talk about a little anxiety from that. The nicotine patch, um, skin irritation is the biggest one with that. And that's well prevented if you rotate where you wear it. So sometimes people are just putting it on either arm every other day. Um, if you use anywhere on your body except over your chest, um, your skin gets a nice break in between uh, each patch and then you uh, don't get that irritation showing up in the same spot. Um, some weird dreams also happen with the patch, but if you remove it at night and put it right back on when you wake up in the morning, um, the dreams won't happen. The nicotine inhaler is really well tolerated. The biggest side effect is people uh, get a little throat irritation or they cough because they take too big of a breath. If you take tiny little breaths, you pretend you're drinking a drink through a straw, um, you get a better effect from the inhaler and it doesn't bother your throat. And then the nicotine lozenge and gum, um, those are pretty well tolerated too, but sometimes people have the tendency to use them the wrong way. Uh, the lozenge is not supposed to be sucked on like candy and the gum is not supposed to be chewed like regular gum. So with the lozenge and the gum, you park them off to the side and you let the medicine get absorbed through your cheek. So if you're chewing the gum or sucking on the lozenge like candy, you might get a little heartburn or get the hiccups, and that's because you're swallowing that nicotine instead of letting it get uh, absorbed through your cheek. Um, so, Everybody's different in terms of how long it takes to stop. And again, there's no, uh, there are no deadlines here. However long it takes you is just fine. Um, and we are strong believers in that if we push you to stop and we say you have to stop smoking within the next month, that creates a lot of pressure for people. It further stigmatizes the issue. They're really anxious. And when you get nervous about something, it can make you even want to smoke even more. And we want you to feel as comfortable as we can help you feel. Um, so we tell you to start using the medicines. Don't change how you're using tobacco right now. Get used to the medicines and it will get so much easier to stop smoking when that cigarette starts to taste really nasty, you don't want the whole thing, and you find that the nicotine inhaler is a good replacement. Um, all right, Dr. Deepak? Yeah, so talking about the fact that these medicines, like remember, like something like Shantix, right? There was such a bad rep about Shantix for a long time, saying that it increases the risk of suicide. That's not true. That was one isolated human being in the boondocks of somewhere who did it and gave Shantix a bad rep. That has been proven wrong. Shantix, Wellbutrin, Nicotine Patch have all been studied and none of them cause side effects as compared to someone who's not using any of that in terms of mental health side effects. Uh, similarly with Wellbutrin, people will tell you that it causes seizures. Actually, the chance of seizures is one is to a thousand. 
And there are many ways of tweaking these medicines and taking it. Sometimes you can take Shantix once a day. Medicines are supposed to be taken in a certain way, but oftentimes I'm talking to my patients about all other medicines too. And sometimes there is a different way that works for a person. And the same thing for tobacco medicine. So science tells us all about the treatments, right? It tells us what is the best treatment for stopping smoking, right? And that's both. That's magnet, making cognitive behavioral changes. That means having the tobacco coach talk to you, making sure that you don't do things to sabotage yourself. Like you keep your pack of cigarettes right next to you on the nightstand instead of keeping that nicotine inhaler. So you wake up in the morning, first thing is that pack of cigarettes, reach out right for that cigarette, right? So things that you do for sabotaging yourself, you stop smoking, but you say, let me prove to myself that I have stopped. Let me go and buy myself a pack of cigarettes and bring it home. Like, so all these sabotage techniques that nicotine is very well known for, we have to work about clearing all of that. We have to work on making sure that we give you coping mechanisms. The things that help are use, keep your hands busy. Keep your hands busy doing something else. Keep your mouth busy doing something else. Is it talking? But for some people, talking also is a trigger for smoking. So then I wouldn't say talking is necessarily a good thing, but maybe singing because you can't really smoke and sing that easily. Um, maybe chewing regular gum, something that's keeping your mouth occupied. Some people put sticks, plastic sticks in their mouth and chew on that. Uh, anything to do some people are playing puzzles online games something that's taking their mind off and also breaking that routine because nicotine is the only substance in the world which is like an alexa which if you, those of you who have seen that amazon alexa or all these smartphones which kind of know what all we are doing or Facebook, which is tracking us all the time. Similarly, nicotine is keeping a track of your entire daily routine. And it sees when you smoke, what are you doing? So a lot of times you'll find that you go to the hospital, you don't want to smoke because you're admitted to the hospital. Nicotine doesn't recognize that. So it's like, hmm. This is not a place where this person's smoking. So let me not give them the alarm to pick up the cigarette. But the minute you're discharged, the alarm comes on, tick tock, tick tock, it's time to smoke the cigarette and you don't even realize it and you're subconsciously doing it. So a lot of times what we are telling people is break that routine. If nicotine and coffee are best friends, then maybe drink a glass of water before you drink coffee, maybe switch to tea, do something else to break the routine of smoking. Do other coping mechanisms. So in spite of all of this, why do people struggle to stop smoking? Because anything happens that's stressful. Remember, it it's, pretends to be your best friend. So when you're in stress, you're going to go to the most safe place and do the things that make you feel the most safe, right? The most comfortable. And for people who use tobacco, it is using tobacco, unfortunately. Even though it's not a real, it's like a fake news, but they do go for it. Grief is one of the most common reasons. And this can happen even after 30 years. It, people have stopped smoking for 30 years and they pick it right back up. Incorrect medicine use. So, We've asked you to use the patch, but you take out the patch and smoke or you the patch falls off and you don't you're not diligent about using it or you take Shantix, but you don't smoke for several days. And then you say, oh, no, now I need to smoke. So you stop taking Shantix. So incorrect medicine use the nicotine inhaler. You draw a deep breath on it like how you would a cigarette and it makes you cough and you're like i'm done with this inhaler so incorrect medicine use has a lot to do with anything 
as a lung doctor, I just finished telling someone today that lung doctor relies on inhalers for their medicine. So a lot of our people who don't get benefit from medicines are because of incorrect use of medicines, especially inhalers. We see that a lot. And then honestly, not engaging with the tobacco coach, right? You can call Julia, you can text Julia, of course, within the times, but she's there for you. She's your coach. She's there with you on this journey. We are there with you all together on this journey. So engage with the person who can coach you. It's like playing sports, right? You can do better if you talk to your coach, but if you don't talk to your coach and huddle off in the corner, you're not gonna do well in your next game. So this is all about engaging, utilizing all your resources. I tell my veterans, if you have faulty weapons, then you're not gonna win the battle. So similarly, this battle against tobacco really needs all the weapons you can use, which is the correct medicines, the correct behavior changes, engaging with the tobacco tree, engaging with the coach. It's very important. Now you are going to slip up. Everyone slips up. Everyone slips up in everything in life. Anyone who told you that they've never slipped up in anything, they're lying through their teeth. That's fake news right off the bat. It's okay to slip up. It's completely okay to slip up. You get yourself back on and back on the bandwagon again. That's what you need to do. You need to just pick yourself back up, say, I'm going to try again. Because you know what? Failure is the stepping stone for success. And that's true for anything in life. You fail at something once, you are determined to get it right the next time or the time after that. You will keep fighting till you get it right. So it's okay. Nobody has to be perfect here. This is not about Miss Popularity or Mr. Popularity or any kind of popularity contest. It's not about how soon can you stop. It's about none of that. It's about how can we make you start feeling good again, your body and your mind, both together. Next slide, please. Now, I cannot not talk in something about tobacco without talking about lung cancer screening. Now, unfortunately, lung cancer screening doesn't have a Susan Komen. It doesn't have a race. It doesn't have anyone saying, oh, you need to do lung cancer screening. Everyone knows you need to do a colonoscopy if you're a certain age, but nobody talks about lung cancer screening because they say, oh, that person smoked, it's their problem. It's not their problem. It's not the problem. I've told, we've told you that it's really not the problem. The problem is actually all this marketing and the tobacco companies. So if you smoked and you've smoked for what we call as 20 pack years that you smoked for a pack a day for 20 years, or you've smoked two packs a day for 10 years. So when I say 20 pack years, it's at least 20 pack years. You could have smoked much more than that. If you have smoked at least 20 pack years, you're smoking currently, or you've stopped within the past 15 years, and you're from the age of 50 to 80, you qualify for what is called as lung cancer screening. So how do we do it? We don't do it by x-rays. We do it by CAT scan, which has very low dose radiation. And what does it do? It picks up spots on the lungs. So why do we need screening for lung cancer? Because lung cancer, unlike any other cancer, does not produce symptoms till its late stage. So if you start having symptoms of cancer, like weight loss, loss of appetite, fatigue, cough, coughing up blood, shortness of breath, by that time, usually it's late stage of lung cancer. And unfortunately for lung cancer, you catch it early in the early stage, it has excellent prognosis, meaning you live longer, you live healthier. But 
If you catch it late, unfortunately, that is not true for lung cancer at all. Unlike other cancers like breast cancer, people can even have late stage breast cancer, but they live for a long time. Lung cancer is unfortunately not that forgiving because remember your lungs take in all the environment. Every breath you take, you're breathing in the environment. So the lungs are much more sensitive organs. So this CAT scan is usually done once a year and it is done mainly so that we find spots in the lung and we follow those spots in the lung and make sure they are not worrisome. Now, having said that, most of the people who live in inner cities or in places where there's a lot of pollution are going to have spots on the lungs, but there are spots which are considered not worrisome and there are spots that are worrisome. And that is why you get CAT scan so you can see it because CAT scan shows it much better. It's like high definition television versus those old tube televisions where you couldn't see anything else. That old tube television is what the x-rays are. X-rays are not good at it at all. Next slide, please. So how do you sign up? Very many, many different ways. How do you sign up for tobacco treatment? Anyone age 16 and older can sign up for it. Any kind of tobacco product, we have people who vape, we have people who use chewing tobacco, hooker, we have people who smoke. You don't need a referral for this. Most of the insurance are accepted and it depends on what insurance our, uh, our uh, practice takes and our, it takes nearly all the insurances. That is our number, 410-328-8141. And you will find somebody in our office, usually it's Sherry Webster, and she'll help you set up the appointment. You can choose to come in person, or we can do a telehealth appointment. Till now, luckily, we've been able to do telehealth appointment. Usually that virtual appointment has to be a video appointment though. It cannot be a telephone appointment anymore. Uh, we are located currently at the UMMC Midtown campus, right there on 827 uh, Linden Avenue on the first floor. We are going to stay in the same street, but you're going to this fancy building, which is right across the street from us and we'll be in the ninth floor. That's why I've said address change. It's the same address, it's just a different building. It's got, it's very fancy building. We're waiting to go into our fancy new office. Next slide, please. So those of you who are providers in this call, you can call our office. You can email Sherry Webster. Uh, there are different ways of electronic referral in our EPIC system, which is our electronic health record system. If you type in smoking, you usually get referral 100 or referral 139. Referral 139 is our clinic. We used to be called Tobacco Health Assessment and Treatment Clinic. It was called that clinic. And now we are calling ourselves UMMC Tobacco Health Practice. Uh, Referral 100 is the Maryland quit line. Uh, and just choose a diagnosis related to tobacco. For those of you who are uh, people in here who are not uh, doctors or other healthcare providers, nurses, nurse practitioners, ask your healthcare providers to refer you to us. Next line, please. And I would definitely be remiss if I did not thank the Maryland State Department Center for Tobacco Prevention and Control, who have been phenomenally good to us by supporting our entire health practice, helping me hire Julia, set up, hire all these other people who've been in this practice, who are helping people, and Dr. Khanna, who's definitely been my inspiration, mentor, who continues to help us with the entire UMMS wide tobacco health and a lot of our uh, 
uh, slides and ads here were from Stanford Research on Impact of Tobacco Advertising. So thank you very much. Happy to answer any questions. And of course, call Julia. When in doubt, call Julia. You can also reach me on my email, but when in doubt, always call Julia, Tiger Julia. You can Tiger me too, but definitely Tiger Julia. If anyone has any questions, I would love to Thank you, Dr. Deepak and Julia. Yeah, I don't see any question out of the year. Anyone has any thoughts? I'm not seeing any questions in the chat. Or any experience that they want to share? Dr. Deepak, can you hear me? Yeah. So we do have one question. Um, someone asked, who is considered a non-smoker and quitting for how long? So a non-smoker, so basically quit, it doesn't matter how long back you quit if you've smoked for at least five pack years, that means we have smoked a pack of cigarettes for five years. Uh, some people say a pack of cigarettes for 10 years. Beyond that, you're considered, or most of the uh, definitions say, at least if you've smoked 100 cigarettes in your lifetime, you're considered a smoker. So uh, unfortunately, I hate that word smoker because it um, seems to give you uh, adjective. I would say a person with tobacco use disorder because it, we don't want to give people an adjective, but 100 cigarettes in your lifetime is considered as someone who has had tobacco use disorder because, uh, but for us, for all relevant information for risk categorization, we say at least about five to 10 pack years doesn't matter when they quit. They could have quit 50 years back, 60 years back. It still is considered as relevant. We received another question. When is it too late to stop smoking? Never. Never is the answer. It's never too late to stop smoking. Even if you have a lung cancer diagnosis, it's never, or any other cancer diagnosis, it's never too late to stop smoking because when you stop smoking, you do get benefits that you have not even thought about before, that you feel you can breathe better, you don't have to use as much medicines, you can save money, that's an added benefit because I, we just heard from someone it costs, it costs $11.71 for a pack of cigarettes where he lives. So that's a lot of money that you could save, but there's never, never a bad time to stop smoking, never. The answer is you can stop smoking anytime, anytime. They'll also make uh, like treatments easier if you've been diagnosed with cancer and you have to go through chemo or you have to get surgery. All those things will be easier on your body if you're not smoking and you'll have a faster recovery. Um, for example, like wounds heal a lot slower if you smoke um, and wounds need good blood flow, flow to heal. So if you don't smoke, that blood flow gets better and it, healing is a lot easier.
received another question. How does the program work? So it works just like a regular clinic. So basically coming to see the lung doctor, uh, whether it's me, it's uh, any of my colleagues, uh, and you're coming to see the tobacco coach. So you're coming to regular lung doctor clinic. So you come into lung clinic uh, and we see you just like a regular patient. Uh, there is no, we don't do group sessions. We found that number one, it doesn't work and everybody is an individual. So we like to do it more individualized. Uh, we go through all the aspects that is we talk about why is it so difficult to stop smoking? What has been your journey for uh, stopping smoking? What has worked? What has not worked? What is your routine around tobacco? Uh, we ask all of these questions and then we kind of talk to you about the effect of nicotine on the brain. We do not talk to you about the effect of nicotine on your body because you hear that from everybody. You don't need to hear that from us. And then we come up with a plan together and Julia talks to you about all the medicines, the side effects, how do you take the medicines, how do you keep engaged. Julia, you want to add more? We absolutely see the best results too from patients who are engaged with the clinic. Um, so the people who stay in touch and let us know when they have questions, you know, if the patch is really bothering you and you're not wearing it, let us know so we can help you get through it or find an alternative medicine um, so that you don't lose progress that you've already achieved. Um, and yeah, it's just like any other visit. We're not here to judge you um and never feel afraid to call us or let us know like hey i went from smoking one pack a day to two packs per day what am i going to do I, I can't tell them i'm so embarrassed you never need to feel embarrassed about it and more than anything else stopping smoking is not a quick fix right it's not like quick glue that you expect to see miracles right and i would say that tempering your uh, we help you also understand the limitations meaning know that this is not going to be tomorrow i'm going to wake up and i would have stopped we don't say that and things like hypnosis and stuff like that we've heard from people they've tried that all that is great but it really doesn't help you cope with the actual problem which is the which is the effect of tobacco or the disease that is produced by tobacco How frequently should former nicotine users see someone in the clinic for maintenance? What are some ways that you help guide um, to prevent relapse? Julia, do you want to take that? Um, so sometimes your follow-up schedule depends on like if you have lung issues going on, if you're having some trouble with your breathing, we might need to see you a little bit sooner. Um, but usually the second appointment is like eight to 12 weeks after the first one. And we're still talking to you in the meantime, um, you know, making sure you got those medicines, you understand how to use them, et cetera. And then the follow-up schedule after that um, is just determined on how you're doing um, and how often you want to come back and see us. But uh, the more the merrier, really. <laughs> and more importantly, keeping in touch with Julia, right? So a lot of our patients are still in touch with Julia in spite of the fact that they've stopped smoking quite some time ago. And the thing about the treatment for tobacco is just because today you stopped smoking okay and today you're on a patch and you're using other medicines doesn't mean you stop you have to use the medicine sometimes three to six months or even longer after you stop smoking so that you stay stopped because otherwise you can relapse and that is one of the commonest mistakes that people do is that they stop smoking and they say, hallelujah, awesome, I stopped smoking, so let me stop the medicines. It's not like that. You have to continue, it's like blood pressure. If it's uncontrolled and it gets controlled, you don't stop your blood pressure medicine. So similarly, these medicines have to be taken for a longer time. We definitely decrease the frequency, the dosage of the medicine, 
but they have to be taken for a longer time so that you stay stopped. Do we offer telemedicine for individuals who may not be in the state of Maryland? Yes, we do. And uh, we did some for uh, somebody who was in Virginia. It all depends on your insurance, honestly. As long as your insurance covers it, we are okay. Like, I honestly don't even know who has what insurance. I try to see people. Uh, and, uh, but uh, unfortunately for us, uh, insurance uh, is something that our practice looks at so if as long as the government still allows us to see telemedicine and we doctors are hoping that they never doctors and other healthcare providers nurse practitioners nurses and everyone are hoping we never ever take out telemedicine uh, as long as the world is as it is now yes and we have time for one more question. I know we went through some of the treatments and therapy options available. We had a question that states, is there a new FDA approved drug to aid and stop smoking? So there is some talks about certain drugs. They are being looked at. It's mainly in Europe. There are some trials about it. There was a lot of discussion of one of the trials actually which was going to be conducted in the HIV center but that drug fell through so it there are may, there are certain other medicines which we do not use that commonly like clonidin like uh, amitriptyline nortriptyline these are not used commonly because they don't have the best side effects honestly amongst all the controller medicines shantix has the best effect I don't own any shares in Pfizer. I don't care about Pfizer. I just care about what it does to help people. And Shantix has really been proven to be the best effects. And there are there is more and more data and more and more recommendation coming up that we should try to use that as our go-to medicine. Though currently Shantix is not available on the market as the brand name, it's available in the generic form. Great. So thank you, Dr. Deepak and Julia, for your time today. For everyone online, you will receive a recording of this presentation for you to go back and listen to again and also share with any family, friend, family members, friends, or loved ones. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much for having us. Thank you.